So thank you once again uh, for joining me. Um, we're going to continue our conversations exploring the deeper issues of intense attention and what they mean for organizations and their success and leaders and their success. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to explore this issue of maturity with you. Um, you know, because I, I mean, I mean, as I was saying, before we, we started recording, I was saying to you that behind the word maturity is is really the heart of what it means to to succeed as a leader, but not just as a leader, I suppose, as a human being. So it's a really big concept, but, you know, you know, and I, it's kind of a bit of a mundane word. It doesn't like grab us and inspire us as much as, as it should, I think. How, given how significant it is. Um, but I think a useful way to get into this concept of maturity is actually through the lens of coaching and, and kind of maybe start there and then we can explore this concept of maturity a bit. And I think it maybe is more than one conversation that we actually need to explore, you know, mm. what this what this concept entails. Um, yeah. But I, so, I mean, starting then, Getting into it through looking at it, the, the, the lens of coaching and kind of positioning where this variable of maturity sits in, <clears throat> you know, in the in the life of a leader. I just want to give some context to how we approach the issue of coaching and the levels, the levels that exist within coaching. Right. Mm. So typically, I mean, if we're talking about executive coaching, you know, mm. and, uh, executive coaching is really coaching for senior people in leadership, really kind of. I suppose from one point of view, mature, at least in terms of their development through the hierarchy of corporates, right? Um, you know, but what's the structure of our executive coaching? You know, what structure does it take? I mean, essentially our executive coaching has three levels to it. And at the bottom of the level, the bottom level is 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 what we call gripe to goal, or maybe it's coaching to engage the will. And that's really about helping people kind of the, 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 the real base level of coaching is helping people get past some gripe that they might have, something that keeps them stuck in, in a sense of victimhood, you know, kind of actually just engages them to start to, to turn a gripe they have into a goal and do something about it. You know, I mean, the, the second level of coaching then is, you know, is, assuming that they are kind of engaged in pursuing goals is then to to work on cultivating what we might call their technical competence their technical leadership competency you know and this will involve looking at technical issues associated with leadership like boosting eq active listening giving feedback in a certain way you know what's your tone of voice you know you know how do you set up the conversation it's kind of you can it's like almost tick box of leadership uh you know how to execute these leadership contributions that might be required of you also performance assessment technically how do you assess performance mm -hmm. you know technically how do you go about coaching someone to improve their competency on an issue how do you technically hold someone accountable um how do you set standards those are all sorts of kind of technical leadership issues that that one one can typically work with with an executive when you when you're doing a coaching and care and growth coaching um, but I do think it's not the most profound level at which coaching actually needs to happen, right? So there's a level bit above that, above this technical issue. And, and that's really what I, what I've started calling transformational coaching, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think the, the most profound value actually sits at this level of transformational coaching. And, you know, the idea of transformational coaching is really about trying to cultivate personal growth and uh, foster a deep commitment to selfless service and contribution. And so what we're trying to work on here is the character of the individual, right? We're trying to nurture the development of their character, trying to empower them to embody certain values of unconditional giving that have a lasting impact on the lives of others. So, um, you know, and it's really about the helping people develop a, a level of existential gravitas, you know, and it's that kind of gravitas that's required to have 
a transformational effect on others, which is, which is, I think, the heart of the leadership problem. How, what is the effect, the transformational effect you have on others? And in order to have a good transformational effect, you have to have that. This has to be something about you, you know. Yeah. So mm. you know, and I mean, so I hope this makes sense in terms of the the, the three levels of coaching. I mean, yeah, I suppose absolutely. I would just start with the question then to you within this context of 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 how you know because I think. Where you where you ex are, are best at as a coach is not really in the technical competency parts of the problem. Mm. It's 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 in this transformational part of the problem, you know. And and I think this transformational part of the coaching problem is underexplored and and even by ourselves not understood to the extent to which it it needs to be because of the the significant impact it has. So I mean, can we maybe start with this question to you? I mean, what is it, you know, if you look at these crucial relationships where you've had this kind of relationship with a coachee, what is it that you are trying to cultivate in this person that you are coaching? Um, if you give me license, I mean, I'd like to explore the issue of maturation and maturity. Uh, because that is the base place that base place this is working on, and then actually um, indicate what all three levels that you're describing have in common, because they do have a, a theme in common, and then kind of that I think will sort of um, help to highlight the specific focus um, of the sort of third level that you described. Um, I, I think in the first instance, the kind of the contribution we've made to this whole idea of, of maturation and maturity is to explicitly link it to the, the issue of, of intent. And um, uh, basically, we're, we're, our argument has been that the architecture of intent is very simple. In any situation, you can either construct your intent on what you're getting in other words, anything that, that comes from other to self, or you can construct your intent in what you're giving. Um, if one views that not as, as, I mean, it's binary in any given situation, but if one views, view, views that almost as, as, a, as a range of kind of completely here to get to, or to completely here to give, that is also then consistent with the distinction between immaturity and maturity. So in a sense, what I'm trying to say is the, the more mature people are, the more they'll construct their intent on what they can contribute. And this is, I mean, we, I think we've got a reasonably solid argument to make the case, which is just to look at the, the process of maturation in people. I mean, um, in the first instance, maturation is a process, you know, you know, um, uh, it is incremental because that's what the word process means. And um, and like any process, it starts somewhere and it ends somewhere. So so maturation like is like production, like a production process, an administrative process or, um, uh, you know, uh, a metabolic process will start somewhere, go through an incremental move and then end somewhere. So it's an incremental move from beginning to an end. If you think of maturation from that point of view, then the process of maturation starts at birth because, you know, and um, um, and clearly it ends in death. And the significance of those two moments from an intent point of view is actually quite profound because at birth, the infant has had nothing yet. So whatever the infant is going to get, the infant will still get which means that both you're here to get in the most unconditional sense of the word. You're here to get unconditional. Um, when you die, you don't get anything. I mean, um, you know, because you can't take anything with you. Um, you give everything unconditionally, uh, which but, um, and people might say, oh, but I mean, when I die, I don't give anything. Everything gets taken from me. But I mean, that just asks a different question, which is what's the difference between giving something and having it taken from you? And so if you have, um, if you have a, a gold coin in your pocket and I steal your gold coin, then you've been taken from. If you have a gold coin in your pocket and you see your neighbor's son is about to die of a horrendous disease that, uh, that surgery is going to help, and you give the neighbor the gold coin to save the son's life, you've given the gold coin. Now, the difference between the first experience and the second experience is not the gold coin. 
In other words, not the thing that leaves your hands. It is your intent. And um, what's interesting is about the first intent is the first intent kind of uh, the, the gold coin being taken from you leaves you depressed and, and angry. The second one may, it sort of makes you feel fulfilled and elevated. Now, if we say in the last moment of your life, you're going to do everything's going to leave you unconditionally. The only choice you have is the degree to which it is given or the degree to which it's taken. And it suggests that just like the giving of the gold coin, if you if that is a moment of unconditional giving, it is a celebration of your life. It is um, it is an ecstatic experience, which basically suggests that the process of maturation is a, the process of the maturation of the intent to give unconditionally. That is the base plate of our understanding. In fact, of of what of the cultivation of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. Everything that we do is around that theme. The three levels of coaching that you refer to actually all refer back to uh, that sort of base plate. The issue of gripe right to go really tries to address, it's a conversation whereby you try to address anybody who's experiencing, who is in a victim experience. Because a victim has a gripe. A victim is saying, this is what they've done to me. Whereas if you shift the gripe into a goal, then you're saying, this is what I'm going to do. In other words, you're shifting from what's being done to you to what you're doing. That's consistent with the shift from what I'm getting, what's being done to me, to what I can give. So, so, so the gripe to goal process is actually almost a, it's a primary building block skill to help people in the incremental move um, from uh, uh you, you know in, in in their maturation and dare i say that that basic conversational skill of helping somebody turn a gripe into a goal is actually still consistently there as a skill in the other two levels of conversation because you you at the end of the, if, if you're having any kind of conversation coaching conversation with somebody at all you're helping them or you're trying to help them make sense of the world that they're in and how they feel the world is impinging on them and how they can translate that into what they can do. So that fundamental right to goal skill is a very useful skill to have and stays almost as a little bit of a base plate, um, almost like patter in terms of having a good conversation with something. The, the second level of of coaching that you were speaking about, which is the sort of technical leadership coaching, you know, which is basically about how do I do things? How should I do things? That's consistent with helping people translate outcome into process. Now, what do we mean by that? Outcome has to do with the results that you get from the work that you do. It has to do with, you know, uh, production results. It has to do with uh, sales results. It has to do with, with profits. It has to do with turnover. Anything that goes onto a scoreboard, that's a result. You never give a result. You get a result. A result is always the outcome of a piece of process. It's really understanding the difference between playing the game and what goes on the scoreboard. Now, the game that leaders are playing is very often a complete black art. I mean, they kind of do a lot of it by the seat of their pants. They don't understand their own process. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the technical things that we've developed in our kind of suite of, of care and growth uh, leadership understanding is really about giving a leader the tools to translate an outcome into process. So... Actually, if I'm going to get people to give attention to the right things, if they report to me, what must I ask leaders in my organization to be giving attention to? When there's a crisis um, uh, or there's some sort of exception, particularly a really destructive or negative exception, how do I work out what I personally need to do rather than just um, uh, sort of institute a control mechanism that will sort of uh, sort of fix the problem cosmetically and actually entrench the cause of what's going on. So it's really the, the secondary coaching that all this, not, not secondary, that's the wrong word, but the second level of coaching that you refer to is really the fundamental thing you're doing there is about you helping the leader 
to shift their attention from outcome into process. That's also consistent with shifting their intent from what they're getting, which is the outcome, to the process of what they're doing or giving themselves. So there is a golden thread that links these two levels. Right? Now, at the highest order, you can say, well, let's take all the technical problems out of the, for a moment, park them. Um, um, we understand the practical benefits of uh, shifting your engagement of something that's making you feel trapped to what you can do. I mean, that's obviously helpful. We understand that the technical benefit of, of shifting your, your attention from an outcome to a process, because again, that's empowering. It gives you attention to what you can personally do. But let's have a look at the existential issues. Let's have a look at, at to what degree are you willing to actually make the cultivation of your intent the primary focus of your own life? Mm -hmm. Now, there are more things involved in doing that than just um, uh, knowing how to deal with a problem or knowing how to translate outcome into process. Um, one of the first things you need to come to terms with that is, I mean, there's really two broad categories of issues. The first is the whole idea of your engagement with the world around you and by implication, the, the contribution that the enterprise that you run makes to the world. Now, this is all of the senior people that I've worked with. This has always been, um, how can I put it? Um, it's been a touchstone theme in our conversations which is how does your enterprise make the world a better place you know um how do you as a leader in fact it's very often led by the person i'm talking to so i, I very often i'm just the the mirror to the conversation that they they kind of have with themselves so the leader is saying to themselves i i find the demeaning to think that i run this enterprise just to enrich shareholders and owners I think my life is worth more than that. I think that the people who run, who are in my business are, are, are making a bigger contribution than just sort of shifting a, a, a dial on a share price. Um, uh, how do I, you know, I, I, how do I wrap my head around that? What does our enterprise contribute to the world? How do we make the world a better place for doing what we do? Um, you know, um, how we call that, we've got a technical term for that. We call that a benevolent intent. In other words, what is the giving intent of our enterprise? And how does that then translate into how I sort of orchestrate this enterprise? I mean, you know, who are the people who add the value to customers and clients? You know, and uh, who are the people who support the people who add the value to customers and clients? What exactly do the people who add the value to customers and clients actually do, which does that, uh, change the life of customers and clients, add value to them? Um, uh, therefore, what do the support people have to do for the people who are doing that work? And so that is, is, um, um, is an ongoing conversation point that people, senior people start to have which is not just about, you know, how do I deal with the current crisis so I don't feel like a, a, a victim? And how do I, how do I sort of, for instance, um, design a, a performance management process that puts attention to the right things? This is really how, what is the meaning of what we do? That's the one level of work that senior people are interested in. Um, th there's also a hierarchy in that work because this level of work, which is about the social engagement, making the world a better place, mm. is kind of an entry point to a higher order question, which is what is the significance of being alive? Who am I? What am I? What is the significance of my own death? Is my life actually only just about leaving a legacy? Is it about leaving a contra uh, an, an enterprise that makes value and makes a contribution to the world? Or is it is there something more to this? I mean, um, um, uh, you know, what does it mean existentially to be here to serve? Uh, what does it mean in terms of what I make significant and how the issue of significance patterns? You know, uh, and that starts to develop a curiosity in what we would understand as genuine inner work, which is 
basically learning to cultivate uh, uh, what we would call an inward gatheredness. Mm. You know, a person is yet to give, basically knows how to restrain themselves. They develop an inner life. They now have to step into themselves and disengage the world. They have an objectivity to the life that they they, they lead. I mean, um, um, uh, you know, they, they, they're not hooked by outcomes and things they're trying to achieve. Um, and it's also then that they 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 have a, they they do have an understanding of the fundamental frailty of their condition as a human being, and that um, that that actually the the mo- you know being being here, being unconditional, being here to give unconditionally also means foregoing a pretense of usefulness, because the I mean the. The, you know, there's nothing useful about a corpse. They're so useless, we kind of either burn them or put them in the ground. We try and get rid of them. So, and that is your destiny as a human being. So this thing of being, of, of genuinely being unconditional about what you're giving means having a relationship with your life which is bigger than just the social good. And the, 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 that is very often where that conversation then sort, sort of gravitates to which is really your sort of your deep existential issues as a human being. And you can almost view these issues as almost like layers in an onion, you know, um, uh, that that on the periphery, well, how do I not get overwhelmed by this disaster that's just happened to me? Well, thinking a bit longer term, how, what does that mean in terms of what I should be giving attention to and how my day-to-day work job right? Go, going into that, well, well, what does that mean in terms of actually you know, comporting myself as uh, in terms of my relationship with the business and what am I trying to take this business to? But the heart of that is, is, is you know, what does it mean to be a human being uh, irrespective of leading? What does it mean to be a human being? This astonishingly kind of, uh, kind of paradoxical experience of being this tiny intelligent consciousness spot surrounded by a vast emptiness of fathomless universe. I mean, what is my fundamental ex- uh, existential engagement? And how do I make sense of that fundamental existential engagement? Mm. Now, what is true is not everybody is ready for that ex- that conversation. Mm. No, I mean, that that is something. And, and, and what's also true is that you don't actually take somebody there. That person finds you because they're now beginning to struggle with those issues in their lives. So in that sense, there's um, the word coaching is slightly dangerous because it's you know it, it has within this the competence competent one making cultivating people who are not comp- you know and with these latter ends you cultivate nothing you basically help somebody clarify what's going on in their own minds. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean you can't um, you can't. Uh, cultivate these contemplations in the one who's not contemplating like this you know it really has to come no, exactly no it, it also means that th- that kind of level of leaders is a, quite a rare breed you know it gives a distinguishing mm. principle to to the, no, to the right. higher end of leader because mm. the higher end of leader is the leader who's grappling with these things mm. you know but you know, this is not something you know. It's not a technical thing. You're gonna, you know, you can help someone who's not there. You can help them with the technical stuff, right? Mm. You know, and that'll be beneficial to them. But there's a still there's just a level at which they're not engaging, which is you know, yeah. And I want to explore that actually a bit more. I mean, I just wanted to. You know, I mean, what you were saying about, I mean, the first, I mean, this trans, you know, the, the third level, you know, and you're mm. saying the first aspect of it is really concerned with, I suppose it's purpose and it's purpose of organization. And it's really significant mm. to wrap your head around that. But, you know, and I, and I was watching, you know, you sent me this, this, uh, this video about how Elon Musk runs his companies. Mm. Mm. And, you know, that I really enjoyed that. But what what's mm. one of the things that struck me was um what he called his thousand year goal right mm. if you recall so yes the, the th- what i mean 
and it's quite a genius idea actually so the thousand year goal of tesla is something like make human life um sustainable or something like that you know mm. and then mm. uh, uh spacex is take consciousness to the stars or something like that mm. you know um but what's interesting is that the whole business is structured around that thousand year goal all kpis are structured against that thousand year goal mm. Mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. i mean this this joe justice who was talking about it one of the things he said is that um that's one of the most difficult things to, for for leaders to wrap their heads around actually organizations to wrap their heads around like there's a hesitancy they you know to actually wrap their heads around the fact that we aren't here to make a profit we're here to make an, a, a contribution and that everything we do is about that contribution. And the irony of Elon Musk companies is that they aren't run for profit. They run, you know, all money goes back into the organization, right? They, run, run, yeah. they run for the contribution. They run mm -hmm. for the thousand year goal, right? So mm -hmm. they run for the purpose of the organization. And the irony is that they they are the most exceptionally profitable and successful organization yeah, can, you're going to find can, in the world. Yeah, right? Make a lot of money. Yeah. They make a lot of money. Yeah. Their share price is just consistently through the roof. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, it's, um, but have you actually seen this? I mean, have you seen this take hold and, and, and manifest in leaders, you know, this actual, this actual connection with purpose, I suppose. You no, know, mm -hmm. Yeah, can we explore that? I have. I, I've, I've seen that a number of times in my career. And every time where it's genuinely happened, you could see the effect on the enterprise. It was literally like the enterprise getting a shot in the arm. And it's in very different enterprises. I mean, um, uh, you know, sort of heavy mining, um, financial services, uh, telecommunications. So very different kinds of enterprises. When, whenever I've seen that thing happen, that the, the leader really is intrigued about making the world a better place by doing what they do. Um, uh, the, uh, there's a marked effect on the performance of the organization. But, you know, the problem with... The problem with uh, sort of putting forward enterprises as paragons, like Tesla, or a leader like Elon Musk, is that we we tend to overlook the the fundamental transience of the human condition, mm. you know. That's true. So um, I've I've worked in enterprises where they did amazing stuff around purpose, and they really, as a result, mobilized a huge amount of energy. Um, under the leadership of a, a leader who wasn't even necessarily very charismatic. I mean, one of the guys I spoke to was really, or was worked with was really not at all a charismatic leader. He was very unassuming. But um, but the, the business did well. They shot out the lights. They did, you know, literally within three years of him leaving, leaving the business because he retired. He was a old, too, too old to do the job. Um, uh, that business imploded because the person who ran, took over the business after him uh, had a different understanding of what business was there for and ran the business in such a way so that he basically would be able to enrich the executive team that was running the business. And, and literally all of the performance that had been gained, all of the, 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 the contribution that had been made over sort of 15 years got reversed within a year. And it was as quick as that. The place imploded. So, so, um, I mean, the fundamental variable that you're working with is the intent of a human being, which is by definition a moving target. You know, as people mature, they generally should become more and more uh, contribution oriented. They're more concerned with what they're giving. And then they die. And then somebody else takes that. You can't. And then by definition, you're going to slide down because you're dealing with a younger person who's got so, so this this idea that the organizations are these sort of fixed, stable places that things go well um, is and, you know, and that you can have this iconic business that everybody can look to for you know like a century. Look, that model business. 
That's just not how human beings work because the organization doesn't exist independently of each of the individuals in the organization. I mean, the, actually, those nodes are actually what the organization is concerned with. And the essence of each one of those individual human beings is that this is a human being is on a maturation journey themselves. So actually, you, you kind of, or it's more like a tide that you're looking at of sort of like, like datum points that, 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 uh, you have a group of people grow together, grow together, and then suddenly start falling off. And then maybe other people come and it pulls the, the average back. You know what I mean? So um, I'm very nervous about looking at uh, uh, organizations like Tesla uh, and, and saying, well, this is a paragon. Very useful things one can learn from them for now. But, um, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, be careful not to turn it into some sort of a paragon. No, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, because, I mean, even within that, wh whatever might make us right now turn it into a paradigm, what, what actually sits behind that is is the issue of intent, which is, I mean, purpose is intent. I mean, what is a purpose? And in pur a purpose mm. is uh, a, an intent, right? That's what a purpose that's right, is. That's right? Right, yeah. And right. that, that purpose sits in the chest of a person, you know? Mm. So, you know, the person goes, the purpose goes, the person changes, mm. the purpose changes, you know. So, uh, you know, mm. I suppose it's exactly what you say. And um, yeah. there's also, I mean, there's, so the, the thing that makes the whole sort of Tesla experiment intriguing is, I mean, the one is the idea of the thousand year purpose. Mm. But the other is how they come up with a really novel answer to the problem of, of control. So, I mean, the reason why we have controlling organizations fundamentally is because people are either not competent or their will isn't yet mature enough to be entrusted with a particular level of decision. So because that, no, 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 you don't have the authority to do this. You either not don't know what you're doing or you can't be trusted to do this because you might be acting for whatever reason. You know, we need to control this. And in a sense, all organizational structure and system is really about a web of control mechanism and mechanisms. And that web of control mechanism gives you the almost the fundamental rationale for the hierarchy and the, ste the steepness of the hierarchy, the depth of the hierarchy. Now, what Tesla, and I, I, again, I, I, I speak under correction, I don't necessarily understand what they've done, is that they've taken away the necessity to, uh, to ask for permission by giving people access to a whole lot of decision matrices which are app-based. In other words, I don't, you know, if I can't make the decision instantly myself, I'm working on a piece of kit and I want to change it. If I can't change it instantly myself, then I indicate what I want to change on an app and then I get the outcome of an answer. So, in other words, it removes the requirement, apparently, for hierarchy. Because you, 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 now, the implications of that from the point of view of the maturation of individuals, I haven't wrapped my head around, and I'm not sure no, no, what that means. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that that means you now necessarily have people who are uh, fundamentally more trustworthy and more uh, concerned with what they're contributing. Um, yes. I may do, I may not do. Uh, the sort of, um, yeah, I, I don't know that one can circumvent hierarchy with an app. I'm not convinced. Yeah, because an app can't, I mean, you can't circumvent purpose. I mean, and mm. as you know, I suppose there's a probing question into that. You know, what are some of the things, you know, if you look at some of these individuals who, who have wrapped their head around purpose in in their organization and what that actually means how is it that that is patterned in their interactions with the level beneath them their direct reports and how how mm. is it that that has mobilized the organization because mm. you know it's not just the app of the must companies right right now mm. that those decision made decisions are automated you know that the the authority mm. and decision making is automated you don't need a leader but there's also mm. something about how the purpose is manifested in the organization right which i think 
yeah, comes also from an individual. No, absolutely right. And there you can't you can't circumvent the problem of the human being. Uh, um, <clears throat> so I, I have a, a sort of almost like a bit of a dark side example of this. We have um, we have a client who is in in uh, in furniture retail. Mm. And, and I think you know who I'm talking about. But um, and their their uh, their mission is turning turning houses into homes. I mean that's the contribution they're making. Um, uh, and it's, what comes out of that is like a, a sort of a, an Africa wide uh, sort of sense of making the world a better place for the average African householder. Mm. Now they had. Um, uh, th their stores were, you know, there were all these disturbances in South Africa last year. With a, uh, in January last year, twenty, what is twenty two, with the the, the the Zuma case and him going to jail, and, and then all all around the country, malls were attacked, and communities went into malls and burnt stores and destroyed stores. And unfortunately, it's this particular business trades in that sort of market segment. So a lot of their stores got burnt. And, and uh, that, uh, there, was, so there was then a crisis of conscience with this man. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be helpful. I'm trying to make a contribution to these people and they burned down the store. I mean, what is this? You know, um, now, you can't guarantee it. You can't. How can I put it? There's no control mechanism you can put that make that experience um, uh, irrelevant. At some point, there is going to be an individual human consciousness that's engaging something at this sort of, you know, um, but, you know, why am I making this contribution? Look what these people are doing. They don't deserve the contribution we're making, you know. Um, so, 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 uh, however you look at it, there's no way you can actually finally circumvent. You you can't take you you can't circumvent the problem of the individual world, the individual human being. Um, uh, you can't turn that into an app. Uh, there's an there's a further aspect to this that I wanted to explore, which is the connection between maturity, as you were describing it. You know, in the second aspect of your existential grappling. Um. Now, I want to explore the significance of that and and the profundity of that, actually. Mm. I mean, and the, the first question I want to ask is, um, what's the connection between this and, and spirituality? And is, you know, is this actually a spiritual problem? Well, I, I definitely think it is. So the shorthand logic of the problem that we faced with here is, so you're asking me to give. Yes. And you're asking me to give unconditionally. Yes. You're asking me to trust that things are going to work out if I give unconditionally. Yes. Why on earth should I? The answer is, well, if you look back at your life, can you account for the benefit and the blessing that you have now and experience now on the basis of your own, is all of it the result of your own good fortune or your own, sorry, your own genius? And it takes an incredibly arrogant person to say yes. I mean, honestly, I mean, you know, so you have to recognize that what you've achieved is a product of something bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. Which means to say that your understanding that you are, are able to give and can give and forego control and construct your life on the basis of what you can contribute is based on an understanding that your life has worked by a genius which is bigger than your own. That there is some kind of uh, benevolent sort of uh, guiding light to this whole experience of being human. It's in fact that conviction that makes you fundamentally trustworthy. You know, you cannot trust a person who's always conditional, always trying to negotiate in their own interest. You can only trust a person who can genuinely suspend their own interest 
on the interest of what is required of them in the situation that they're in. You know, a person who knows that their life works despite them in, in, by a genius bigger than their own is a person who will trust that if I forego my own interests, all will be well. You know, otherwise, it is almost impossible to do what is right rather than do what's expedient. So I do think that the thing that we're dealing with is a spiritual problem. And it's a problem that has to do with, so it's not just the meaning of the, my life and the meaning of my enterprise vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, you know, society. What is the contribution we're making to society? It's also, you know, um, uh, is, there, is there a meaning to be a, being alive uh, over and above that? Mm. Is my life uh, the product of something bigger than myself that I have a living engagement with, and that I have a, sort of that I'm I'm sort of in the process of of sort of developing some kind of conscious relationship with? Yeah. So our answer to that is yes. Um, our answer to that is is we're convinced that that being here to give unconditionally also means being able to understand that your life works by a stupendous kind of logic which is bigger than yourself, and that puts you in a position to look out at this extraordinary universe that we're in and be in a state of of rapture and awe, and that experience of rapture and awe is the highest human experience. There isn't a second one to that. That is in a sense why this. Kind of scaffolding of a human carcass has been made as like a, a platform to house this experience of amazement and all of how stupendous this whole thing is. You know, now now when when a, when a leader has that experience, you know that person walks into a boardroom and there's they they don't have to say a word. There's like a, a a luminescence that kind of comes from them that just enlightens everything around them. You know, they have they have a gravity. That is the root of gravitas. Mm. You know, what does gravitas say? Hold on, boys. All will be well. Mm. Now, a person who's completely enchanted with existence knows this. They can say. They, they exude this. They don't even have to say it. They, they exude. Don't panic. All will be well. Mm. We don't have to control. We can sit this one out. All will be well. That's amazing.